Thank you that the blood of Jesus washes our sins away. Woo. We thank you that we can stand before the King of glory, pure and holy. Ha. We can come before his throne. Ha, ha, ha. Woo. Without shame. Without condemnation. Lord, we can stand before you, Lord. He said we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Ha. Woo. Hey, hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. Woo. Satarabo Lord, you said that we enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Yes, Lord. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, Lord. So we enter into where you're at, Lord. We yes, come Lord. into your presence, Lord. Woo! Ha, ha, ha. Woo! Sarabo Lord, we declare the kingdom of God is at hand. Lord, the sick would be healed, the lame would walk, the blind would see, the deaf would hear, the dead would be raised. God, every sickness, every disease, every affliction, every infirmity would have to go. Yes. God, that we are going to see what you told us we could have, Lord. Ha. Yes. Lord, we want it. We want what Jesus paid for. We want what he paid for, God. God, we thank you. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We thank you for what you've done and what you've been doing and what you're going to do, Lord. We give you glory. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Ha. We're not the same as we were eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, Lord. We're different, Lord. Ha. We thank you for it, Lord. Right. Woo. Ha, ha, ha. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen. 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 Ha, ha, ha. Wow. Welcome. It's different every night. Just don't know what's going to take place yeah. Woo. praise God for the house fires out there we pray that the fires are burning across the land Woo. Ha, ha. Oh, she's got somebody back there. I was really hoping that Tibby would come up here and yeah. give us a little testimony was what I was yeah. hoping might happen <laughs> yeah Well, I mean, the camera was getting excited back there last night, or you know. <laughs> is that microphone on, Pastor? Yes, it is. Check, check. No, I know. Hey. I talk about the, oh. the prophecy is. Wow, maybe I should do mics. <laughs> it's time to get stretched. Oh, Lordy. What do you want me to share about? So, so, you know, we had a talk the other day, but you've been here the whole time. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> I'm just going to sit. No, I won't. That messes up the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> so, you were kind of watching for a while, but. Yeah. S something yeah, kind of got on you a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did not want to be here in all full disclosure at the very beginning. And um, I didn't have to be because <laughs> that first week we we're, you know, figuring out the whole life and world thing. So um, the first night I did have to be here, I was pretty upset about it, not going to lie. And that's the funny part, though, is um, they had me just pray downstairs, but you can't pray in tongue for three hours and be mad. <laughs> you just can't. So um, by the end of that time, the Lord just spoke to me, and he said, if you were not required to be here, you wouldn't be. <laughs> and that hit me really hard, and I was like, yeah, maybe I need to check some priorities here. <laughs> So, yeah, we've, we've been here for a while, and um, I've just been an observer until last Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was thunder for those that can't hear it. <laughs> um, so basically, we all got in a giggle fit. We call it our fabulous Fridays, our funny Fridays, our freaky Fridays. It's Fridays. It just happens. So you're all here on the best night. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, no, last Friday, I originally actually just started laughing at people because I thought they looked ridiculous, and then I couldn't stop, so I became one of the ridiculous ones. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's been a little odd, and then last night, if you weren't watching or if you weren't here, towards the end, Pastor Day was giving a really powerful prayer, and I was in that back booth camera, which there is, there's an angel back there, I'm just telling you, so. <laughs> By the end of service, you're like, I'm trying to keep the camera on you. <laughs> but, uh... Um, they had everybody turn and pray towards the camera, and I was like just staring at the screen. I was like, if I look at a single person right now, I'm gonna <laughs> not gonna be able to stand in this box back here anymore. So, <laughs> but there there hit a point where I I couldn't. So I was like, just don't move the camera, just don't move the camera, just don't move the camera. <laughs> That's where I'm at right now, and I'm not even on camera. <laughs> Is that good enough? Is that what you wanted to hear? Fire! <laughs> Amen. Amen. So you just keep hanging around it long enough. Something's yeah. going to, you just don't know when. I mean, in the most least expected time. I mean, in Acts chapter 2, suddenly. Yep. And that's the way it tends to happen is suddenly. Yeah. Uh, woo. Saul was on the Damascus road and suddenly he was looking at the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he didn't have the luxury of carpet. <laughs> Woo. So, hallelujah. Mm. Praise God. So, I want to turn to Mark chapter 4. I'm excited. Uh, I heard from our friends from Arkansas. They're flying in on Tuesday night. So, I'm excited about them being here. Some home folks. Woo. Close to home, Arkansas is not too far, and uh, it'll be fun. So, Mark chapter four. Verse 24. And he said to them, "Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use. It will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So it leads to believe there's some action beyond hearing. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use it, with the same measure you use it, God's going to take that and bring increase to it. So, I mean, it's, it's, we could sit around and just be hearers, but James talked about don't be just hearers, but be doers of the word also. So we believe that there's something... I think one thing a revival does is empower, and I believe there's an apostolic impartation. There's an empowerment to do what we're hearing. Not just to see. Not, I mean, we want to see. With, when we see stuff happening with our eyes, it helps build our faith. If our faith's not being built by the Word of God, at least if we see it, you know, we begin to say something's going on, and if we don't just turn around and run, and then God begins to build it inside of us. But the end goal is not just for us to experience. The end goal is for us to take what God's done in us and release it on other people. And it, and it says here the parable before this in Mark 4 and 15. Where it says in 13, do you not understand the parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. 
And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So it's like that word leaves us. I mean, when we leave out of a service, how long does it take for that word to leave us? We need to realize that the enemy's coming to try to steal that. He don't want you to use it. We have to grab a hold of what God does. We have to protect what God's doing. And then we have to come to a place where we're using what God is asking us to use. What he, you know, we're talking about laying hands on people. We're talking about praying for people, talking to people. And so when we begin to use that, how do you grow in the anointing? Not by just getting more people to pray for you, but when you take what you've been given and you go and give it away, that's how you begin to grow in the anointing of God. It says, likewise, there are ones sown on stony ground. When they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and then they have no root in them, in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when troubles, tri- uh, tribulation or persecution come for the word's sake, immediately it is, uh, they stumble. So the, everything here is coming against us, hearing the word. You know, the enemy doesn't mind so much for you to hear the word. But he, might, he wants to steal. I mean, he's coming to steal what we've heard. So he can render us useless. Then the next one, verse 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, what Lindsay was talking about, the cares of this world, Too much stuff takes up our time. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. The pursuit of riches can be a dangerous thing. I believe God anoints people for business. There are some people it's just like, it just come off their hands. I mean, everything they put their hands on just turn to gold. You're like. I work just as hard as they do. I know I'm as smart as they are, but everything they touch just works. I just, you know, there's an anointing. There's a grace from God. And uh, sometimes they take that and, you know, we're going to teach you how to do the same thing. Well, you can teach and teach and teach, but unless God puts that grace on you, it seems like this just don't work. Desires for other things entering there choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But there are ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 volts. So we hear the word, and we begin to produce what we've heard. We begin to act on what God's giving us, just like that offense. You can hear about being offended, but then you could hold that in your heart and not do anything about it. Not, not make that right of somebody you're offended with that you have to go to and make that right. If you don't do that, the enemy is stealing that word. But when, he's, when you allow the enemy to steal that word, God's also saying, whoever has, to him more will be given. So there's an important purpose in hanging on We can't grow with hearing, 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 and never doing. There comes a point in time where God says, you're not using what I'm giving you. So I'm going to take away what you have. Ooh, that'd be rough. You think about hearing, I think about Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So hearing the word of God, hearing, we got to hear, and it begins to build our faith. But if you go back up, it says in verse 14, how how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? So preacher means proclaimer, heralder, one that's speaking or talking. Sometimes it's from a pulpit or a platform. Sometimes it could be one-on-one, but somebody who's declaring, what are they declaring? What they've heard. They're beginning to exercise what they've heard. 
Revelation 19.10 says the, the spirit of prophecy, the, test, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So what does that mean? So when we testify, just like Tubi did, when we testify, whether it's in church or whether it's around somebody else, when we're testifying about what God has done in our lives, it releases a prophetic power for it to begin to happen in that person's life. When you start testifying about, man, I was in church or I was at somebody's house, they prayed for me, I got healed. See, you've heard it, you were experiencing it, but a lot of people, they're healed and they never tell nobody. I don't know if they're embarrassed or what, but God does a mighty work. I mean, there were some in the Bible Jesus had. It's like they just went around, went off and didn't tell nobody. But when you hear, when you hear, I got born again. Jesus came into my life. Everything's changed. The testimony about Jesus and what he's done releases a prophetic word for that power to hit somebody else. Man, you're a herald. How can they hear unless God sends somebody to tell them and speak to them so that they can hear what God's saying? And, and then as you testify about what God's done with that person and it touches them, they get born again. Then God gives two or three people, four or five people. God begins to increase what he's given to you because you're using what's been given. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. We got to do the stuff. And you know... We're not naturally inclined to do this. That's why we need the Holy Ghost, and that's why God gave the Holy Ghost. Right. Woo! So you can be, he said, you shall receive power to be my witness. Wow. Yeah. Woo! So I can tell what I've heard. What did, what did Peter and John say when they're being locked up and threatened? We cannot help but speak what we've seen and heard. Well, they, they just began to go and speak what they'd seen and what they'd heard. And it had an effect. What they'd seen and heard began to be released on other people. And the same things began to happen to those people. And as that happened, God gave more to the ones that were giving it away. I mean, it started in Acts chapter 2 and 3 there with miracles. But in Acts chapter 5, Peter's shadow, it appears as healing people. It says they're bringing people from all the surrounding villages and everybody that came from the other villages, it says they were all healed. Amen. Woo. Wow. But if Peter and John and James Woo. would have seen what they saw and kept their mouth shut, nothing would happen. Maybe if we realize there's, it'll encourage us when I give this away, more's coming. Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo, more's coming. As I give, it'll be given back to me, pressed down, shaken, and running over. I like what happened to uh, Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 14. It says in verse 8, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, and he leaped up and walked. What if Paul would have never said anything? There was something stirring in Paul, seeing him and said, man, this guy's got faith right here. Ooh, something's about to happen. And, and it's great. When faith is arising, but there are times when the people we're praying for have no faith. You understand that? I mean, Jesus raised a dead man. The, the woman's son, they're having a funeral. The funeral's going by. Jesus interrupts the funeral and raises the son from the dead. The son had no faith. Lazarus had no faith. His sisters didn't have any faith for what was about to happen. So it's good when people have faith. But we don't always have to depend on them having faith. We need to depend on us having faith. 
and God showing up in the middle of it. All I can do is say, I say what I've seen and I've heard, and it's about to come on you, and then it's up to God to do his part of it. Because he says, back in, says the kingdom of God is like a man should scatter on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade and then the head, after that the full grain in the head. So the man doesn't know how he's sowing the seed. He's speaking what he's seen and he's heard. And he don't know how. Just like the farmer planting that seed in the ground, he's doing what he knows to do. And somehow while he's sleeping at night, that ground, that uh, seed begins to sprout and come up. It begins to grow. And, and God likens the kingdom of God to us planting seeds, the word of God being planted as a seed. Sometimes it grows real fast. Like instant. Randy Clark defines the difference between a miracle and a healing. A miracle is something that happens instantly, right before your eyes. Healing could be progressive. Could take a day or two. Could take three days. Could take a few months. And so he planted the seed. He spoke the word, and God decided the time period on what things were going to happen. Now, some people say, well, I prayed you know, I, I asked God to heal me one time, and I'm not asking him no more. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep praying until it manifests. When, when I, in 2007, I had an attack of the enemy. It wound up being congestive heart failure. It wound up having a pacemaker defibrillator put in, and God actually touched it in 2010, and I was off my medicine until 2015, and I had another attack. I actually got defibrillated three times, and that sent me on a spiral course to the worst point in my life. Uh, Miss Carol knows because she was praying for me during that time as others were praying. And I don't know about you, but that whole time, I didn't refuse anybody praying. Pray as often as you want to. And maybe I didn't have great faith, but I had great need. And I remember two very powerful prayers. One of them was my mother, who's in heaven right now. But she'd seen, I mean, I'd been with them in town, and they'd had to take me to the emergency room because my heart was pounding so hard. And so she'd seen how bad I'd been suffering. And she, she was raised in church, and her and my father met in church, but they'd gotten out of church. And I'd never heard my mother pray before, although she told me she was praying for me. And her leg was broke. They'd put a pin in her leg, and actually the pin had broke and her knee was turned around and the doctor was gone for a month and couldn't do surgery on it so she's having to deal with and so she said pray for me before you leave and I was down on my knees had my hands on her legs and I began to pray for her she put her hand on my back she began to say, oh, Jesus, heal my son. Heal my son, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, touch my son. Man, she was weeping and crying and crying out to God. And I was like, oh, my. Man, God just heard mama's prayer. Something's about to happen. <laughs> Woo! I knew I wasn't going to die then. Amen. Now, everything didn't change right then in the natural realm, but everything changed in the spiritual realm. Yes. And then later that summer, the first time I was able to get out of my house, I went to a youth camp. I could lay in the bed all day and just go to what I felt like I could go to. And there was a, a man at the youth camp. He was older than I am. And they're having the service my heart was so, I couldn't go in the service during the worship because the drum beat would mess my heart up. 
So I had to stay outside until they quit playing the music. And then I'd go inside, and then they were ministering to people, and I went by my brother there. And uh, I knew he was going through some stuff. I just started praying for him. And I got down and began to pray, and he put his hands on me. He began to say this. I don't think it's a theological sound prayer, but it was powerful. He said, Lord, take away whatever's happened to his heart. I'll take it, God. If you'll take it from him, I'll take it. I mean, that's a prayer that'll wake you up. Because, I mean, I'm thinking, Jesus took it. You don't have to take it. But still, I mean, that's intercession right there. That's putting yourself in the place of that person who's there and saying, Lord, give it to me. I'll take it. Give it to me. He's in heaven now, too. His heart failed him. Among the others... But it was the end of the year, New Year's Eve night, back at that youth camp at a different time in the middle of the night, praying over some kids in a fire tunnel that God's hand came down and touched my heart. I felt God's hand. I mean, I'm looking around and I'm not getting, I'm, I'm trying to pray for people and all of a sudden, my heart went into rhythm. I'm like, Something just happened. I mean, because when you're least expecting, now see, we've been praying for a year. And it all started when we started getting on a conference call before Christmas of that year. Before in 2014, at the end of the year, we were having a conference call and we were having prayer. People were, a lot of people were coming on this call and we were having prayer. And the second week, I couldn't even do it anymore because my heart was tripping out. Miss Carol was having to take over the conference call. I couldn't even get on the call no more. And then right after that's when I got defibrillated. So we've been praying that whole year. And the next year, coming into the new year, it happened. One year, almost one year from the time. Of when I started getting defibrillated, God healed it. With nobody actually laying hands on me at that time, God healed it. So you don't know. We don't know how this stuff's going to take place. We just keep pressing in with what we know how to do. We just keep praying. And I tell people, you know, if you're not healed, keep coming. Keep getting prayed for. Keep pressing in for the things of God. And, you know, the good thing about it is we don't lose. You're either going to be healed here or you're going to be healed there. What did somebody say the other night? The biggest, if the biggest threat the devil has for us is heaven, he's got a, he, he's going to lose this game. <laughs> he's threatening us with heaven. It's not too good of a. Woo, so we pray, we keep declaring. It's amazing what you'll see. I remember one time. In uh, the first church I pastored that Christmas, I went with the uh, Southern Baptist, invited me to go to the jail and hand out sack, uh, sack lunches to all the inmates in the jail. We didn't really pray for them that much. They witnessed to him, gave him some tracks, and so I started going back to the jail. I mean, that was, that's really kind of where I learned how to preach is go to the jail twice a week. Amen. They're a captive audience. <laughs> I mean, if you can preach to inmates, because that's, that's, you know, sometimes that's prison uh, is the easier ground than jail is because they know they're not going to be there long. And they can basically tell you, just get out of here. And so I began to go preach to them. In one area of the jail, there was where you could just walk around the outside of the bars, and the sheriff would just let us in there. And they had cells, and then they had lockdowns, and you could just walk around and start off just praying over them. Because when I walked in there, they said, preacher, we don't want nobody preaching to us. And I said, well, I didn't come to preach. I came to pray. I just walked around the outside and prayed. Wasn't nothing they could do about that. But after a couple weeks of that, they started asking, well, what about this? Well, what about that? And then I'd start preaching to them. Whatever subject came up, that's what I'd preach on. Then then there was another part of the jail that was like for the Friday, Saturday, Sunday inmates. 
You go up there, and there's just a big open room, and there's cots, like 14 cots on this side, 14 on that side. They're all in just one big open room. They're not that dangerous. they just drunk driving or something like that. And so I'd go up there and minister to them. Now, they, most of them wanted prayer. Most of them wanted to share a word with them. So I went up there, and, and once there was two sides. And one side, they loved to have preachers come in there. The other side didn't want no preachers in there. So that seems like a good place to go. So we went in that side, and we walked in there, and the first thing, one of them came up to me, and I said, does anybody need prayer? He said, I'll tell you what, preacher, you need to pray for that sheriff. I was in a car wreck that rolled over. It hurt my back, and I've been telling that, telling that sheriff for a few days now that I need to go to the doctor and get some pain pills for my back. You can pray for him if you want to pray. I said, why don't I just pray for you? Yeah. He really wasn't interested, but he let me pray for him. You could say he had no faith. So I just prayed a simple prayer because I was ready to get out of there. Lord, I ask you to heal this man in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless y'all. The next week I came back, went in that one side, the good side, and I came out of there, and I'm just passing by. They had a little window on their door. I'm just passing by that side, and they're in the window. I'm like, let me in that side. I went in that side, and them guys are like, you won't believe it. After you prayed for him, the next morning he's up running up and down through here, bending over, doing all this stuff. He didn't have no pain in his back. I mean, every one of them in there is like looking, man, this was something. Because they know he'd been griping and complaining and in pain, and then it's gone. And I said, who wants to pray now? Every one of them got in a circle. So what least likely looked like it was going to be a good situation, amen, I was ready to get out. I said a simple prayer and left. You could say maybe I didn't have a whole lot of faith. But God took that seed and he did something with it. We just don't know when we're sowing seed. That just happened to somehow be good ground for that day. I remember going into a prison. I, I don't know why these people like to call me. I got a, a friend that is the director of Teen Challenge. And I'll see him every couple of months, or he'll give me a call. Say, Brother Bill, we need you to come by here and preach on Thursday night. We got some new people in here, and they need you to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. They need to hear about signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm like, why don't you? you got a whole bunch of preachers in the city. Aren't none of them talking about this stuff? I had a friend who's an evangelist and a minister in Portland, Oregon. And he'd read my book, and I'd read his book, and he'd call me and ask about stuff. And he'd said, I need you to come up here and preach at this church. I gave them my best message, and not a single person moved. Now you need to come. I'm like, what an invitation. This place is dead. We've tried everything we know how. Now you need to come up here. Amen. But I believe God's given me a gift for that. I like a good challenge. So I got to go up there and preach in that church. Sunday morning, and I bet three quarters of the people came to the altar that morning. <laughs> and I'm asking him, what's wrong with these people? They look, I mean, they look like they're hungry to God, for God to me. What's your problem? So in this, I went to a prison. We'd go out there, and we had these inmates And one of them, I said, you know, is anybody having like words and all? Does anybody have pain in their knee or their leg? And everybody looked at that guy. So it's obvious he was the one. But he didn't believe in that stuff. He was Church of Christ. 
And so we convinced him to let me just pray a little prayer for him. I mean, he was, not only did he not believe, he was against. It's amazing. I mean, we never know how God's going to move. Sometimes when we really think it's about to happen, it don't happen. And sometimes when we think it's not going to happen, it does happen. If, if somebody thinks they have this figured out, I'd like to talk to them. I mean, it's, we're living in a new world every day. And so I prayed for him, probably not with a whole lot of faith. But I gave testimonies. This is what I've seen and I've heard. I believe God can do it. He reluctantly allowed me to pray for him. Uh, a friend of mine, Brother Jimmy, was actually a Teen Challenge director in the prison. I seen him about a week later. He said, you won't believe it, brother. <laughs> I said, that dude got healed. He's telling everybody down there. Everybody down there is looking at him like, what in the world just happened? We seen you. You didn't believe in this stuff or nothing at all. He's walking around. There's like a miracle broke out in the midst of him. Woo, I'm like, praise God. Yeah. You, just, you don't know. Man, God just said, here, take what you've heard. Be a testimony in whatever God's done in your life. And begin to release that seed. Let it go out there and see what begins to happen. And God's, gonna, God's empowering us to do that. He's empowering us to be witnesses for such a time as this. Empowering us to be witnesses for revival. And I believe there's, I believe there's apostolic impartation. Because I, I saw it at Brownsville and I wondered, what is this? I hadn't seen it ever before until then. But I wondered, what is this? When people come forward, they came forward, they uh, asked Jesus in their life. People got born again was the first thing, altar call. And then they had prayer teams that just prayed for people. All they said was, more, Lord, more. But there was such an impartation from, and a lot of them were Methodists, Baptists, that had been trained and partnered with the church. Prayed for more, Lord. Go outside. Go down the road to the restaurant. People you've seen in there that just came to the altar, they're laying hands on other people. Generally, it seems like most stuff that happens in the church stays in the church. The, the past way we did things is if we went out and talked to anybody, we invite them, come to the church. We have a prophet. Come to the church. We have an evangelist. Come to church. This guy works in healing. Come to the church, and they'll prophesy over you. They'll evangelize. They'll uh, pray for miracles to happen in your life. I mean, that's the way the church has done it in the past. And, you know, that's not the worst way to do it. But at least the people were inviting people, come to church. This is going to happen at church instead of we are the church, and it's about to happen right now. But I believe the apostolic movement that we're moving into, the era that we're moving into, something I saw down there was people, when, when they, I mean, you could even have people in previous times, it seems like they're drunk in the church. They're falling out, they're shaking. But by the time they get to the car, everything's gone. But I saw stuff down there, everything didn't leave when they left the doors. It was with people for days. It was with people went to other churches and revivals, broke out in churches all across the land. Something was carrying. And that's something I prayed for over years from 1997 till 2005. I prayed, what is this, God? And that's when God revealed that it's an apostolic impartation. There was something apostolic going on there. God was giving us a glimpse of what he wants to do. In this end time, I mean, we're seeing the restoration of the apostles and prophets. We're, we're not seeing the fullness of it yet. I mean, in the, in the 80s, 70s, they were talking about prophetic movements and prophets. In the 80s, we begin to see prophetic conferences in the 90s. And then finally, the prophets started saying, the apostles are coming. And we're just now, really, I think, moving into a, a time of apostolic error. So God's bringing the fullness of all five-fold ministries together. To see what he wants to do on this earth. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And that apostolic impartation, man, is something that gets on people and it don't soon get off. 
I mean, it's ascending. That's what apostle means, sent one. So it's ascending people out to do the stuff. And to realize, I mean, God wants to heal us. He wants to fill us. But that's not the end of all things. The end of all things is for us to go out and reproduce what God's doing. We go out and begin to do and operate in what we've seen and what we've heard. I mean, sometimes even if we hadn't actually experienced it yet. I mean, William Seymour, when he was, he'd actually been in a Bible school in Houston, Texas. I believe it's Houston where he had to sit outside the classroom because, like Pastor said, he couldn't sit in with uh, white people. When he goes to Los Angeles, he's teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and he's not experienced it yet, but he's teaching what he's seen and what he's heard. And then a lady in Los Angeles gets baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, and then another one and another one, then a whole house full, and then Seymour gets baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then revival breaks out. So they, they were telling people what they'd seen and what they'd heard. What the word of God says. There was an anointing on it that was empowering them and stuff was happening. Hallelujah. Wow. Thank you, Lord. I mean, I heard about Brooke was trying to take somebody home and missed the, went right past the driveway and wow. on down the road and God has to get us messed up. Yeah. Maybe God was sending him to a house of people he didn't know anything yeah. about yet. Yeah. He's on a divine mission. See, he was locked in. I mean, I got to go somewhere here, and I got to tell somebody here something's fixing to happen. Oh, yeah. Woo, hallelujah. So it's an excitement because most of the time, a lot of people have feared saying much. I know there's a lot of you here that hadn't, but there's going to be a greater. Man, that's why we're soaking. That's why we're praying. That's why we're believing in impartation. That, man, something greater is coming. We want that. Like uh, Lindsay was saying, we want that where there's a presence of the Lord with us that encounters people before we say anything even. They can feel like something, and I've been in those times where you could walk up and people say, whoa, what's that? Yeah. Ooh, makes it easy to tell them what it is. Woo. It's heaven, yeah. and it wants to get on you, too. Come on, Lord. Woo. We receive it, Jesus is coming. We receive you, Lord. Woo. Hallelujah. Woo. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Lord, shatarabha, kuryatarabha, satarabha. Father, we pray for those tonight, God, that are out there. God, we pray. A young lady was, let me see if I can find her name, was on there asking for God to refill her. And Sakatara uh, Bridget, I believe is her name. Lord, refill her up in the name of Jesus. She's in Alabama. Shatakaraba shata. See if I see it here somewhere. Make sure. Sokotarabo koriataraba baba. Whoa. Mm. Hallelujah. Sekatarabo koriataraba. Harabo sakatarabo koriandaraba. Shekataraba. Sokotarabo koriataraba shata. Oh, we pray for her. I believe it's Bridget. What happened to Bridget was uh, uh, last year we were at a church in Alabama and we had a great morning service. And I said, Pastor, I said, Look, we, we'll just stay and have a five o'clock service. And they don't normally do that. Well, the people weren't, their schedule wasn't set to do that. And so our team just stayed there at the church and we slept on the, took a little nap on the pews and waited till five o'clock. Nobody showed up, but eventually the pastor did come back. And I'm thinking, boy, I blew this. I miss God. Yeah, that's happened before. And so I'm saying, well, we probably need to get ready to go. We've missed this. 
And one of the ladies in the church got a phone call. She said, I, this, this lady, Bridget, said, I was dressed this morning and ready to go. And my husband said, if I went to church, he was going to leave me. So I didn't feel like I could come. She said, but I should have been there. I needed to be there. And she said, well, we're here right now. She said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. She comes in the back door. And guess what? She has an audience of about seven people and about four ladies. And all they do is spend time praying over her the next hour and a half. I mean, God set it up for one person. I mean, sometimes we think nobody. But I mean, God set the whole service up to touch one person. And I'm saying, it was worth every minute of staying over if it's just that one person that got touched by God. Woo! You just don't know what's about to happen. And that's her there saying again, fill me up, Lord. She's watching these services. Fill me up, God. Woo! Come on, heaven. And as far as I know, her husband did leave for a while, but he's back now. Praise God. Woo! Woo! If you'll do what God's asking you to do, if you'll do what's uh, right before the Lord, God has a way of helping make everything else right. I mean, sometimes we're afraid, well, I can't really serve God, or this is going to happen, and this is going to... The enemy's always bringing something at you that something's going to happen if you take a step out. There's always going to be opposition and threats. Well, if you step out like this, you're going to lose these people. You're going to lose this job. You're going to, this is going to go away. You're, these people are not going to like you anymore. I mean, everything in the world coming. That's a good sign. You really need to do what you feel like God just told you to do. Yeah, that's right. Woo. I mean, because he's afraid. What is going to happen if you do do that? Not much is going to happen if you don't do it, but what's going to happen if you do it? You know, the Bible talks about you ought to count the cost before you build a tower. I say you ought to to count the cost if you don't build the tower. I mean, if we don't have revival in our nation, what's going to happen? We've already seen the guys we thought were the good guys, the guys that were opening their mouth on TV and said, oh, we're going to take care of this situation. We've seen right now that they're on the other side as much as the other side's on the other side. The the more we look at the news, we see how deep the corruption runs. And it's not just on one side, it's on both sides. And you think, what can we do? I mean, it can leave a person to a point of helplessness. But for God. We think and we wonder, well, could, you know, is this thing so deep God can't figure it out? Oh, yeah, God can figure it out. I mean, if he spoke the word and flung the stars and the sun and the moon into space, caused them to rotate at the right time, I'm here to tell you he can figure it out. There's nobody he can't touch. If he can take Nebuchadnezzar, take him outside, act like an animal for seven years. There's no limit. He's just waiting on the church. Woo, to, you know, to realize, man, I think we need to vote. Hallelujah. But we can't trust in that right there. We need heaven to move. We need the power of God to move in our White House, in our courthouse, in our governor's houses, in our mayor's houses, in our Senate houses, in our Congress house, Congress houses. We need heaven to move. I mean, and I believe the church is coming to that point. We like. Lindsay is talking about desperation. God, we need you to move in our nation. We've come to a desperate point, God. We, we realize we can't rely on men, no matter what they're speaking out of their mouth on one side. God, we need heaven to move in. Yeah. So the fear of God comes over our nation again. Yeah. Let your fear come, God. Start in the church. That's where he said judgment starts in the house of the Lord. Start in the church, God. Let us be burning ones, burning, lit up on heaven. That's why we keep, I mean, God keeps cutting stuff off all the time so this fire can burn hotter and hotter, purer and purer, so that when people come up and have something, they got some kind of, there's no fear here. I was reading that book I've been telling you all about. 
following the fire. And pastor said he had his tent set up in one area. He was part of a denomination. And he had to come out of it because of the fire. And some of those people were still around the areas. And one guy came and he said, I had my little daughter with me. Five years old, and that guy is just tearing me up about every sign and wonder miracle that had happened in our church was the devil. I mean, he was blast, blasting me, not, I mean, just coming and going. He said, I hated for my daughter to be there. And, and he's like, somebody needs to pray for you. He said, you're right, sir. W- w- would you just pray for me? And the guy said, rah, rah, rah. said w- would you just pray for me? And finally, the third time, he got down on his knees and said, put your hands on me and pray for me. Guess what? He got quiet. And he prayed for him. And he said, before he left, he let me put my hand on his head and pray for him. Woo! See, we can. I don't know if I'm burning enough to do that yet. Are we burning enough when the opposition's standing there and you know what's right? And you say, pray for me. Pray for me. And get down on your knees. Woo! The Lord said, bless your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Speak about you. And I'll pour like coals of fire over their head. Woo! Lord, let us be burning so that we're ready for the situation. And there's no fear, God. We're we're not afraid of what tomorrow holds. We're not afraid of what's going to happen in the future. We're not even, uh, I'm determined a kingdom is coming. And regardless of what my eyes see on TV and what I read about, I'm determined a kingdom is coming. Hallelujah. Heaven's coming to earth. Man, God's going to, God's church is not going out here, some wounded, beat up, beat down uh, bride in a closet. God's church, he's coming back for a glorious church. Hallelujah. One without spot or wrinkle. A church full of the Holy Ghost and fire. A church that's hearing from heaven. A church that's operating in signs, wonders, and miracles. Come on. Hallelujah. So we bless those at home, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. We just release an apostolic impartation to them. God, let their houses burn with fire. God, let fire come into their houses. Let the fire of heaven come into their houses, God. We just command sickness and disease to go. We ask for the favor of God to come. We ask for boldness to preach the word of God, to herald and declare what they've heard. They would begin to speak it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.